the Israelis very much managing and controlling the coverage of this uh, conflict. We've now been moved on again. I don't know if we can show you with a camera. The police now waiting to try and move us on here. We've got one, two, three, four, another military police uh, behind that, uh, our satellite van there. The Israelis are now restricting the coverage of uh, this conflict in terms of what we can film to just one, one spot, the very north of Gaza border, it seems. We've been told we have to move back there. So there's a huge media camp there, but it's the only spot we are allowed to film from now. The Israelis are controlling this. It's not what you would describe as the conduct of a democratic state, but they are determined to control the way this is covered, and they're not letting any foreign journalists in, any journalists at all, into Gaza now, now on the 11th day of this uh, conflict. As Gaza militants continue to fire rockets at Israel and the IDF responds with targeted strikes, some curious Israelis have made their way to the Gaza border to catch a glimpse of the military action. Israelis stood near the border with the Gaza Strip to watch the Iron Dome missile defense system intercepting rockets launched from the Palestinian enclave. Around 400 rockets have fallen in Israel since Wednesday and around 250 have been intercepted by the Iron Dome. As men with binoculars watched from a hill near the border, some gave their reasons for being there as the opportunity to see what's happening firsthand. We came to be with the residents of Stirot and to see the airstrikes and to see what is happening in Gaza. We want to know what is happening in Gaza. Around 40 Palestinians have been killed in Gaza since Israel began its airstrikes against Gaza militants. And three Israeli civilians were killed by a rocket on Thursday. Now, RT Arabic correspondent Saeed Suwerki has been working inside the media center in Gaza just before Israeli rockets slammed into it. This is what he told us a bit earlier. No one expected this. During the strikes, power supplies often get cut off. And then it becomes really difficult for us to find fuel for the generator. At that moment, we decided to take a break in our work and go look for gas so that we can continue working early in the morning. We left at around 1 a.m. and at 2 it all happened. Some of our friends are now in hospital. Just a little while ago, there was a press conference where it was said that such an attack must be completely ruled out as journalists can become targets for strikes. The responded to share what he or she sees with the world. Even Israeli journalists report from Gaza. It's unacceptable that media workers get attacked in such a way. In situations like this, we usually don't go to our homes just like we didn't during the hostilities of 2008 and 2009, even though we know this is really dangerous up to the point of a ground operation. However, we prefer to stay at the office using any chance to do our job whenever the electricity comes on. When the electricity was off, we decided to go look for generator fuel, and that's what saved us. We're talking about four tower blocks in Gaza that have been used by media outlets since 2000. During war in 2008-2009, Israel struck these buildings too. Some of our colleagues were injured then. We know that we do a dangerous job. Hello everyone, welcome to GGN. Today is Monday, November 19th, 2012, and I'm Darko. All right, I'm going to cover, um, obviously, Israel and um, some Syria news, and that's probably pretty much all I'll be able to get to. Uh, in that video, we just covered the um, the RT one, RT office in Gaza destroyed by an Israeli airstrike. We had the crew of RT's Arabic language sister channel barely escape death as Israeli rockets targeted the media center in Gaza and destroyed the building where they work. An Israeli airstrike uh, on the media compound in Gaza injured at least six journalists, uh, one of whom lost his leg. Here's one of the pictures. A rocket came through the roof, hitting the 10th floor. So um, this is something that's probably not going to be really covered by the West as far as um, journalists go. Um, they try to exploit that in Syria, but unfortunately it's the rebels that they're arming and the, and the terrorists that are actually killing the journalists.
So, but they'll they'll cover that and they'll say it's Assad's government. Israeli airstrikes interrupt CNN guests from Gaza. There's a video on there. I'm sure uh, many of you have already seen it, but if you haven't, you can go on YouTube and you can actually just, you know, click on this link in YouTube's video description from this video. Copy, paste, you know, and you should be able to find it on YouTube. Shocking video from CNN shows a Palestinian Gaza being interrupted by an Israeli airstrike during the live interview. So the segment entitled Living in the Conflict Zone involved a debate between Gaza resident and Israeli uh, Nahum. So Nahum argues that civilians in Gaza and Israeli cities like his hometown uh, Ashkelon, a target of Hamas missile attacks, are experiencing the same fears but that the situation is worse because Palestinian attacks are designed to hurt as many civilians as possible. The background noise of the bombings can be heard throughout the interview, but at the 253 mark, a huge explosion is heard which makes uh, Suleiman flinch and in turn pretty much destroys Nahum's argument that suffering of Israelis and Palestinians is comparable in any way. When asked what the noise was, Suleiman said, these are Israeli warplanes bombing the Gaza Strip, adding that I'm not going to allow these bombs to interrupt me from having this debate with you and your guests. However, before he was able to finish this point, Solomon recoils as a mammoth explosion shakes his house and sounds of screaming are heard in the background. Next up, we have Israeli strikes kill 31 and Gaza a death toll now over 105 since the war began. We have over 700 wounded across the Gaza Strip since Wednesday and uh, killed another 31 people today with a majority already confirmed as civilians. Uh, the largest single incident took place in central Gaza today when an attack on a civilian neighborhood killed a family of 12 including a large number of children and Israeli officials blamed the attack on targeting mistakes so they probably got that from the US from the drone strikes um, technical error journalists injured in Israeli attack so Israeli war planes have killed two media buildings in Gaza City and injuring at least eight journalists interesting because they also must have took something from US's playbook as well they evacuated after the initial strike which was followed by at least two more on the site. Like I said, that's when people go to rescue um, and aid these victims of these uh, bombs and these strikes. Uh, they go ahead and kill those people that are trying to rescue them. So uh, I talk about inflicting terror on, uh, on uh, civilian population. Gaza ceasefire talks fail on Israeli demands for more buffer zones. So Netanyahu claims negotiations haven't even really begun. So there's multiple reports on the status of the Gaza ceasefire differ on points, but one thing is clear, the negotiations have failed for now, and the Israeli government continues to insist that the talks aren't serious in the first place. I saw on press TV they were talking about um, Egypt's Morzai Obama, who's, you know, all the way across the freaking world, and um, and uh, Natian, who's uh, somehow getting together and creating a ceasefire. Like I said, they don't really want a ceasefire, though. Um, they want to, basically, they want to, remember the last time I covered this was on Friday, they want the Palestinians to basically just capitulate and give up. Um, Israeli ambassador deletes tweet signaling willingness to sit down with Hamas. He blames a staffer for erroneously sending the tweet. So the Israeli ambassador to the U.S. deleted a tweet Saturday evening, which he said Israel would be willing to sit down with Hamas if they stopped firing at Israel. So... And you can check out the uh, video down here and the actual quotes. I'm going to keep moving pretty fast here um, for time's sake. So check out the links. They'll be in YouTube's video description. I'm just going to throw all these out there, these different sources, so you can go there and check them out yourself. Israel looks to significantly expand Gaza war. It says here, Israeli Prime Minister has reported that the military is ready to significantly expand its war on the Gaza Strip with concern that a ground invasion could begin pretty soon with more and more troops deployed in the border area. I want to reported on Friday they had 30,000 followed by 70,000 reserve troops to be called up they were uh, approved so it says although they are uh, talking about um, hyping up this prospect of further escalation and are both ruling out a truce agreement anytime soon they're reportedly receiving some resistance from the international community and um, it says not from Obama the Obama regime of course which has endorsed the war unconditionally that's right they gave them their approval uh, but from British William Haig, who has warned that a ground invasion with large civilian death toll could cause Israel great, um, greatly in international sympathy. So if you look on the news, um, I saw like a, a, an article about Rupert Murdoch and a pretty interesting little article about uh, a tweet that he made saying Murdoch uh, slams Jewish-owned press on Israel. The media uh, mogul Murdoch on Saturday blasted what he called Jewish-owned press for their anti-Israel coverage. So why is Jewish-owned press so consistently anti-Israel in every crisis? 
Um, I don't know how much truth there is in that, but it, there is truth to what he's saying as far as the media being dominated by um, uh, by Jews, right? Some are Zionists, I guess, right-wing Zionists, and some aren't. So it's kind of confusing, this whole situation. You know, it's hard to say as far as CNN and all them go um, – because, you know, they, they've always kind of let uh, people down as far as having integrity and journalism and all that. But um, who knows? Maybe, they, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's some uh, the Jewish community that are, aren't far-right Zionists that, uh, that don't like wars and all that stuff and what's being done in their name. But then there's some people that point to a document, what is it, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, that say, you know, it's all about uh, world domination. So and you, using the media was one of the main things. So, you know, who really knows? I guess we won't know until we see it. But what this is doing right now is it, it, it helps the right wing and Netanyahu and that in Israel for the elections. Uh, it takes attention away from what's going on in Syria. It also creates instability around the Syrian border, which also serves the purpose of um, the Brookings Institute uh, policy think tank document, which basically says they're going to ramp up uh, uh, escalations of violence along Syria's border and that, um, and also with Turkey to get Assad's regime to basically buckle and fall. And, of course, the good old-fashioned international military-industrial complex, which is a lot of weapons and wars being bought up, uh, uh, certain stocks going up, you know, so as the economy tanks. Israeli Deputy Prime Minister, we must blow Gaza back to the Middle Ages, destroying all the infrastructure, including roads and water. So the Israeli Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Eli Yashashi, said we must blow Gaza back to the Middle Ages, destroying all the infrastructure, including roads and water. Says also see this destroying the civilian infrastructure is of course a crime under the Geneva Con Convention. So it's kind of like uh, uh, the Bolsheviks and communists and Leninists and Marxists in Russia. Um, they were able to go ahead and just uh, kill a lot of ethnic Russians. Um, that uh, is really doesn't it goes uncovered uh, throughout history uh, that the Holocaust that actually took place in Russia, and uh, you know it was it was awesome for them right because they can get away with anything because the Soviet Union wasn't under the um, uh, basically w wasn't punishable under the Geneva Convention because they never signed it. So it's kind of like Israel with their uh, nuclear proliferation, right? Yeah, it says here that uh, the indiscriminate and disproportionate use of force, which I think we all know that's true over there in Israel and Palestine and Gaza, collective punishment for the acts of a few, i.e. Hamas, which was created by the globalists themselves, um, you know, it's controlled opposition, so... And it makes everybody else uh, in a bad situation because right now they're trying to get the UN to acknowledge them. That's another thing that's being casted aside here that people need to remember. They're trying to get statehood in that. Uh, and also targeting civilians is, is punishable. So that's also what's happening. Of course, the big one is the recent assassination of Hamas leader, of the controlled opposition leader. And, um, you know, th th right before that, they actually had a peace deal negotiated in Israeli activists with Palestine and all that. But uh, Israel doesn't want peace. So they had to kill this leader to kick this off and play the victim, paving the way for the strike on Iran, the real goal of Israel and Gaza. So the official stated purpose of the operation, which was called Pillar of Cloud, is to stop the shelling of Israeli territory by Palestinian rockets, unmanaged missiles. So the main purpose of the operation was the destruction of important uh, objects and military infrastructure of Hamas, uh, also with its leader and its uh, political structure. But uh, it says Israel also did not roll out a ground invasion for Gaza if necessary. Goes on, it says, talks about the elections here. War could bring serious political dividends to all three major Israeli parties. So it goes on and talks about how the UN uh, is trying to um, like get statehood or be recognized by the UN would allow Palestinians to bring in action against the state of Israel in international courts. The third objective and reason is... Uh, the government of Israel fighting against Iran to attack targets in Iran and avoid possible response from both sides, from Iran and from Hamas. The Israeli government provoked Hamas to attack now that was spent their entire military potential that cannot be quickly restored. The reaction of the world community on all these developments largely appeared to be rather restrained. Of course, American and British leadership was pro-Israel, Europeans are neutral, and Arab states support the Palestinians. It's not just building up for Iran after they take out Syria. Um, you have the UN membership uh, vote on November 29th this month, but also Israel attack Gaza to boost Zionist morale. It wants to give the illusion of victory. Goes on, it says, after um, they failed their goals in Syria and Palestine, uh, U.S., Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Turkey are planning to damage the anti-Israel resistance chain in Palestine to make up for their failure in Syria. 
During the 22-day war in 2008, more than 1,400 Palestinians, including 300 children, lost their lives. This is GGN. Thank you.